stand up and worship this morning.
that some of us are aunts and sisters and friends and spiritual mentors and moms and grandparents, all the ladies of our church, they are all mentors and they have all nurtured and helped develop each and every one of us. A lot of you in this place has helped me a lot and have taught me a lot and have matured me a lot. So we wanted to do this little presentation today to show you some of the faces. We didn't get all of them of the ladies of CT, so watch this. As Pastor Laura said, we do honor all of you uh, ladies who are here today on this Mother's Day. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you and thank you so much for our moms, for our mothers. We pray today for all of the ladies who are represented here today in this place, in person, online. We thank you, Lord, for this institution of, of motherhood, of ladies designed by you who are mentors, who are influencers for you, who cultivate us, who nurture us, who love us, who pour into us, who help us, God. We thank you for the, the plans that you have that go beyond that which we can see and understand and that you can use each of our lives in ways that we could never frankly imagine to touch other lives, to inspire, to protect, to empower others, Lord. Bless the ladies here today. May they know in a special way that we, we love them, we care for them, and we are appreciative of them, Lord, as gifts from you. We praise your name today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We've covenanted together. We've agreed together. We do say a happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day today. At this time, we're going to dismiss our children and our teens to the Deeper Kids Ministry and the teen class. So if you're here and you're a child, you can go this way with your parents and guardians, sign into the kids' ministry, or the teen uh, class is meeting through this door in the Blue Room Fellowship Hall. Have a great day. Enjoy your ministry. And here in this room, we're going to continue to worship the Lord. We're going to look at a few verbal reminders to remind you of a few things that are coming up in the life of our church. We do welcome you here today. If you're here for the first time, we encourage you. Oh, thank you.
Thank you so much, Martins. I appreciate that. Thank you. If you're here for the first time today and you would like to get to know us a little more, please text the word visitor to our church phone number, 1506 634 1688, and we can get to know you and you can get to know us a little bit more. We remind you that the informational hub of our church is our website, so please see our website often, www.calvarytemplesj.com. You can get to know full details there. In your printed bulletin, there's a lot of details as well. I'm going to just highlight a few things verbally. Number one, our Pregnancy Resource Center of St. John uh, annual baby fundraising uh, drive that starts today, Mother's Day, with the baby bottle campaign. You can see Beatrice today if you want more information about that. Uh, you'll find in the uh, bulletin information about baby bottles being distributed today. You fill them up with, with the, whatever financial donations you wish. They come back in by Father's Day and they're sent to the Pregnancy Resource Center of St. John. Number two, want to give you an update on where we are with our church winter furnace oil bill situation. As of 3 o'clock on Tuesday, May the 9th, we've now taken in $9,129, which is great for this $15,000 bill. So we still owe $58,71, and I just rejoice. We had $1,682 come in last week for this cost. So thank you, and I uh, want to remind you, if you're able to help us eliminate this uh, debt, you can make a special donation marked oil or heating, and that will go towards that. We want to get into the summer season with this bill completely paid off and able to continue to minister for the Lord. What number are we on now? Number three. What's happening here this Wednesday morning? There you go, Play Cafe. It's our second last one for the season before we break for summer. And so from 10 until 11.30, this Wednesday morning right here at the church, there's a drop-in time for parents and guardians to bring children aged 0 to 5 to play and to hang out. And we have beverages and uh, uh, for the, for the uh, parents, guardians, and snacks for the kids. And our bouncy castle will be here again this Wednesday. It won't be here the last one in June. We're not able to, but our Bouncy Castle will be here again for this Wednesday, so please note that. Number four. want to remind you, this Wednesday night is our next Women's Ministries event with a very special guest speaker. Marie Moore is our guest speaker from Quizpan Sis, and so please plan to be here if you can, ladies, this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right at the church. And I want to remind you as well, this Wednesday night, the nominations close for the Women's Ministries election that will be happening in June. So ladies, you need to make sure you see the ballot box today or on Wednesday night at the Women's Ministries event. It's going to be a great time here on Wednesday. Please plan to be here. Number five. What's happening here this Thursday at noon? Yes, our pantry ministry. And I just want to take a quick opportunity to say this. Don't know if you knew this, but just want to highlight this quickly. My friend, who's sitting right here, had a hand in helping start the pantry ministry, as well as a few others of you, way back more than 35 years ago. Mrs. Wheelock, it's so good to see you today. Happy Mother's Day to your daughter and your granddaughter. So great to have you here. Our pantry food ministry has been in operation for more than 35 years. And once again, this Thursday at noon, we will be serving a hot meal. We'll be serving bags of groceries. We'll be sharing the good news of Jesus and sharing some live music. And we are so pleased to have the wonderful privilege of serving the Lord through the pantry ministry. So if you're free this Thursday and want to help out, stop by or help us with our donation table. There's a lot of food items there. Thank you for bringing that in. We appreciate your help with that. I lost my place. Number six, is that the next one? Yes. It is, you're right. Number six, I want to remind you, we have a wonderful, delicious roast beef brisket 
fundraising dinner that's coming up in two weeks here at Calvary Temple. All the details are in your bulletin. Please be aware of that. We're trying to do everything we can to pay off the oil bill. So we have another fundraising dinner coming up in two Sundays. Full details are in your bulletin. You can get tickets today from Beatrice or next Sunday or call the office during the week as well. Lastly, but not least, number seven, we have a very special event that's coming up on the same day. On May the 28th, we had a phone call from David Goss, our friend from Trinity Church. He's a historian and author, and he has offered to do a historical walk and talk for Calvary Temple Church and anybody else who wants to come for free after our lunch. He specifically asked that it could be after one of our lunches that we have here. And it will happen in the Uptown, and he'll be highlighting some different stories about the Uptown, and he's hoping to mention a few things about some churches as well. That's happening at 1 o'clock on Sunday, May the 28th, starting right here at Calvary Temple. It is a two-kilometer trek through the Uptown, and uh, it'll be a wonderful time together. So if you can plan to come, just plan to spend half the afternoon with us, come to church, have lunch, and then go for the historical walk. If it's inclement weather, it will still be happening, but we'll be in the church, sitting down, listening to his stories, and seeing his pictures, which he can show on the screen. So please plan to be a part of this. It's completely free, and it's a great opportunity to learn more about our city. And I'll just say this quickly. Our church was featured in a recent book about the Great Fire of St. John. Our, our site here and our current church building was mentioned in that book, and there's some pictures. So please come if you can. It's going to be a great time. I do thank you for your faithful worship to the Lord with tithes and offerings. If you'd like to make a donation today at any time before you leave, you can do that in the donation box here with cash or check, or you can make a donation anytime online on our giving website. It's as we partner together and work together serving the Lord that we're able to change this world with the truth, the love, and the power of God. Amen? So we praise the Lord that he allows us to worship and partner with him. We're going to move into our teaching time this morning. And I want to ask you this question that I want your feedback on. And I'm going to jot these things down. What are some characteristics that mark the worst day ever? What characteristics make a day be a really, really bad day for you? Any takers? Okay, I'm getting it. I heard fear. What else? Emotions. Emotions. Depression. Okay. Depression for sure, definitely. What else makes a really bad day? Stress. Stress I heard. Loss of a loved one. Okay, anyone else? What makes a really bad day? Poverty? Sure. Anyone else? Worry. Anxiety? Worry, I heard as well, which are two big things. I think I spelled that wrong, but that's okay. Anyone else? Loneliness. Loneliness? I heard. What else? Anger, I heard. Mental illness, sure. Anger, mental illness. So you can see there can be a lot of things that can cause us to have the worst day we've ever had. We're going to look at that a little bit today. If you are interested in having a teaching note page, we have them at either entrance door where you came in or there's some right here or they're on our website so you can follow along. Today we are celebrating, of course, Mother's Day, though you wouldn't think it from what I'm talking about. We do want to honor all of the moms and ladies among us, but I want us to look at the Word of God together at the characteristics of the most horrible day. If you have your Bible today or your Bible app, will you turn into the Older Testament, the book of 1 Kings. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. We're going to pick it up at verse 8. The book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, and verse 8. I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever had a really terrible day before. I know I feel like I have. How do you deal with that? What do you do with that? 
We're going to look at what the Bible says. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 8. It says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow, widow there to feed you. Okay, we're going to pause right there, but don't close your Bible. Don't close your Bible out. We're going to walk through this biblical text today. The characteristic number one of the most horrible day is, I believe, found here, being alone. Being alone. Where was God sending Elijah? Just before this Bible passage in the biblical text, Elijah had prophesied of a drought as a judgment against disobedient Israel. And then Elijah hid from King Ahab, the evil king, in the cherub, by the cherub brook, where he was fed miraculously by ravens. When that brook dried out from the drought, the Bible says that God then sent Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17 to a village named Zarephath in Phoenicia, where a woman and her son would feed him and lodge him. So by the time God sends Elijah to Zarephath, this drought that Elijah had prophesied about would have been about six months long. So no dew, no rain, no showers at all. Now in ancient Israel's heavy agricultural society, this would mean quick financial ruin. There would be famine. There would be very quickly death. I have to note here as well, in this biblical text, that Zarephath, I don't know if you know much about Zarephath, maybe you're an expert on Zarephath, I'm not sure, but I didn't realize he was deep in the evil territory of false god Baal worshippers. It was also the ancient home city of the evil and utterly wicked Queen Jezebel, as mentioned in 1 Kings 16. So this widow, this lady in Zarephath, mentioned here was noted as being in the biblical text, a widow. I want to say, losing someone is so, so difficult. If you want to talk about a hard way in life, that's really rough, losing someone that you love. Why would God ever send his spokesperson to a, a widow who's just lost someone in the middle of a drought and say she's going to feed you? This doesn't make sense. Historically, in these times of Elijah in the Bible, widows were usually very poor. Normally in a famine, they were the first to run out of food. She probably hasn't heard enough, God. Why are you sending your spokesperson to her for her apophagia? You want to talk about birth? Come on, God. What's going on here? <coughs> these are the questions I come up with. Maybe when you read the Bible... It's all technicolor for you, and it's beautiful, rosy. I ask questions and say, God, why did you do this? Let's continue reading our biblical text. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 10. So Elijah went to Zarephath. He arrived at the gates of the village, and he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please get me a little water and a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. Don't you love it when that happens? I had that happen once. I should be very careful what I say. But I had that happen once. I had a guest come over and I said, Here, would you like something to drink? And gave them the beverage of their choice and happened to open the fridge to put it back. And they said, Oh, is that, you know, is that sticky buns I see in there? Can I have some of those sticky buns? And very gently tell them we had some of us coming over that evening and we'd make the sticky buns for them. <laughs> it wasn't actually made for that person who just dropped in right then. Elijah, what are you doing? What are you doing? Can you bring me a cup of water in the middle of the drought? And if that's not enough, can you give me a bite of bread too? Elijah, do you have no self-awareness? Why would you ever think it's okay to show up in a village at the gates and, and meet this widow who's gathering the sticks, trying to make something come together for herself here, and then you call her out, hey, give me some bread as well. Why? Do you know why Elijah did that? Because God told him to. God told him to. Characteristic number two of the most horrible day, when God sends someone to take the little that you have. Have you ever been there before? 
You say, oh God, thank you for providing for me. Thank you for this measure of health and strength. Thank you for this blessing of this new loaf of bread or whatever. And then God sends someone desperately in need who needs that. You're like, what God? What is going on here? Sometimes in our weaker moments in life, it can seem, in our fleshly perspective, like God has some kind of a sick sense of humor. You can think sometimes in your flesh, you know, I think God wants to kick me when I'm down. I'm already struggling here. Why would he do this to this widow? Sometimes even when you faithfully serve the Lord, difficult challenges come upon you. I believe God had much bigger plans than just a loaf of bread, just a cup of water. God had much more bigger master plans than even a a keg of oil and a, a package of flour. It's interesting to note here that God specifically told Elijah to go and live in Zarephath. Not just visit, not just stop in, but go and live in that place. Those pagan people of Zarephath. You know, he does that for us today as well. He says, go and be my representatives, be my ambassadors, be my witnesses today. Let's continue reading the biblical text. 1 Kings 17 verse 12. But the widow said, I swear by the Lord God, the Lord your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I will die. Have you ever been there before in life, friends? Maybe, maybe you don't think you're going to die in a moment. Maybe you do, I don't know. But you feel like you've tried everything. You've tried it all. Nothing's working. Nothing will come together. You just feel maybe like you're stuck. You're going to be stuck in that place forever. It seems like there's no hope. It seems like maybe there's no answer. Maybe the end is near. Characteristic number three of the most horrible day when you have a, just a handful of flour left and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug and you gather a few sticks for a last meal. Things look pretty bleak here for this widow, eh? I want to ask this question. I don't want to get too far off track with this, but what kind of a mother is she, I wonder? We don't know. There's not a lot of details listed, but she is a widow, and her son's mentioned a few verses later. I wonder what led to this circumstance that we read about in the biblical text here. Remember, this isn't the end of the story. God is calling this Gentile widow to trust Him for her daily needs. He says that to us today as well. To trust Him for our daily needs. I notice in here, well, I'm going to get off track today. I notice he didn't say, trust your Visa card. I don't find that in here. Am I wrong? Trust your MasterCard. They will provide for you. Was that, was that mentioned? It's got to be Amex, right? Check. Trust your American Express. That's got to be in here, right? Before I get more trouble, let's keep reading the biblical text. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 13. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead. Do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use whatever's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Whoa, can you believe it? The servant of the Lord basically communicates here, yes, it's okay, just go ahead and prepare to make your last meal, but just before, please give me some first. This is a real faith-building exercise here. Out of your lacking, please give freely. Out of your lack, Please give freely. While you seem in and of yourself to be toiling and working and struggling with just a few scraps, 
Keep on keeping on, but, but take some of that little bit that you have left and give it for God now, and then cover your urgent pangs of hunger after that. There's a biblical principle here. There's a biblical principle here. Characteristic number four of your most horrible day, when the servant of God tells you to make your last meal, but first make him a little loaf of bread. Frankly, this is, I think, a very bad day in the life of this lady. Exactly what is going on, I don't know, but it seems in my flesh like it's very unfair. God, why would you do this? You actually tell your servant in First Kings 17 and 13 to say to the widow, don't worry about a thing. You see, I remind you again, friends, we know the end of the story. Elijah knew the master plan. God had a bigger plan. God was doing more here than just being in the business of flour and oil. God had a bigger purpose in mind. God had a bigger thing that he was working out here. There's a real spiritual principle. I remember in my own life when I was younger, I first learned about tithing and also giving financial offerings to the Lord in worship from my parents when I was a child. My parents didn't have a lot. It wasn't for a lack of trying. They worked hard to try to make ends meet. They worked a bunch of jobs and tried a bunch of different things. But frankly, life can just be really tough sometimes. I was a very sick child. There were medical bills. There were times in my life I remember as a child that people dropped off groceries on our doorstep. There was a time when I was very young that our electricity was cut off. It couldn't be paid and it went into arrears. But from the moment that my parents became Christians, when I was one year old, they learned to faithfully give monetarily in worship to God. They learned to be tithers, not tippers. They didn't tip God. Each week, just give them a pittance, you know, 0.001% of their income, whatever that was, from wherever that was. But they learned the spiritual principle of tithing. Because people say today, you know, tithing's an Old Testament principle. Well, in heart, yes it is. But you know what the New Testament principle is? Jesus said he wants all your heart, all your money. So it's up to you. You can give them all or you can give them at least 10%. I'd say we should land somewhere in the middle and worship them in love and grace. Amen? Not a lot of amens when you say things like this. It's kind of quiet. I thank the Lord that God teaches the widow here in this biblical text. He said, I quote, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. There's a promise of God here, friends. God is basically communicating through Elijah, the widow of Zarephath, this is not your last meal. This is not going to be your last meal. Though things look bad, though things are tough, though you're probably weary and worn, awesome Almighty God has other plans, and in and through this, He will work for His kingdom purposes. Be faithful. Be obedient. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's look at the next verse. First Kings 17, 15. So she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. Hello? She only had a little tiny bit of flour left in the bag. She only had a little bit of oil in the container. But it says Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. Why? Because verse 15 of the first bit said she did what Elijah said. There was always enough, verse 16 says, flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Characteristic number five of the most horrible day, two words, but God. But God. The miraculous, graceful provision of God is found in these verses. Did the widow of Zarephath faith waver at all yet? No. What did she do? She went off and did exactly what Elijah told her to do. So things turned out precisely as he said that they would. The widow's obedient response resulted in God doing the impossible in the middle of this ravaging drought. She had daily food miraculously for her and her family and Elijah. The jar of flour didn't run out. The bottle of oil didn't become empty. 
what is this? It's a lot more than just some cooking ingredients being gone a little further than expected. God promised to do this and fulfilled his promise to the letter just exactly as Elijah promised it for the Lord. I don't know if you've ever heard of Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee, also known as Nee Toshen or Nee Tioshen, was a Chinese church leader and Christian teacher who worked in China during the 20th century. He was imprisoned in 1952 for sharing Jesus, and he died in prison in 1972. He once said these words, Because of our proneness to look at the bucket and forget the fountain, God has to frequently change his means of supply to keep our eyes fixed on the source. I'm going to say that again. Because of our proneness to look only at the bucket and forget the fountain, God has to frequently change his means of supply to keep our eyes fixed on the source. Friends, today, what is the source? Jesus. God is the source. The Lord is the source. Faith is the step between promise and assurance. Miracles can seem so out of faith for our feeble, out of reach for our feeble faith. But every single miracle, no matter how big or small, begins with an act of obedience. First Kings 17, verse 17. Sometime later, the woman's son became sick. He grew worse and worse until he finally died. Verse 18, Then the widow said to Elijah, O man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come to point out my sins and kill my son? Isn't it interesting here in this biblical text? God had done such great things, this miracle of provision. She had been obedient. And yet now, in this moment, the troubles aren't automatically over. She's faced with another very difficult obstacle. Friends, today we need to learn in our own lives to depend on God, not on circumstances. I'm going to say a radical statement. We even learn to not trust in the provision of God, only in the provisions, the money, the gas in the tank, the house, the apartment, the nest egg, the family, the people. We don't lean on those things. We don't depend on those things. We don't even depend on the blessing of God in that he does provide much for us. No, no, no. We need to learn to depend on God. God himself. Not just what he does. Characteristic number six of the most horrible day. When things turn deadly and get worse and worse. That's what it says in the little text. The lady's son got ill, and she, he grew worse and worse, and he finally died. Why, why are we so quick to point fingers and blame God? Why? Why do we do that? It can be so easy to say, okay, God, you brought me here. You led me here. You got me to this point, but what are you doing? First, you want a little tiny bit of oil and flour I've got? You want first? I'll take second. I did that, and now you take my son. Why did you do this? We don't understand it all. First Kings 17, 17, it says that after this supernatural, bountiful delivery of continual flour and oil, this son, unfortunately, still became sick. The sickness took the worst turn, and he died. Sometimes we can think, well, things could be worse. This seems to be the worst. Worst case scenario for this lady. This woman of Zarephath bluntly lashed out at Elijah. Why did you show up here in the first place? Some holy man bartering in. What did you do? Come to expose my sins? And now you've killed my son? How do we respond when things go horribly wrong in our earthly lives? How do we respond when things go deathly bad? Not the way we hope, not the way we pray. How do we respond? It's a question for us to think about. 1 Kings 17, 19, But Elijah replied, Give me your son. 
and he took the child's body from her arms, carried him up the stairs to the room where he was staying, and he laid the body on the bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, why have you brought this tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? I see very honest words here, friends. I believe truly that Elijah genuinely struggled here in his humanity. God, why would you do this? It must have been excruciatingly difficult to, to take the widow's only son, to pry him from her arms against her chest, and to carry him up to that loft where Elijah was staying. He laid him out on the bed, and he struggled. He said, why have you done this, God? Even Elijah asked, why, Lord? Characteristic number seven of the most horrible day, you ask, why have you done this, Lord? Why have you done this, God? In your own life, you ask, why have you done this, God? I don't understand. These verses remind me that it's okay to feel pain. It's okay to even struggle and to ask God, what is going on? God, I don't understand your complete design. But in the midst of it, we must call up to God. Don't turn in anger and bitterness from God. Don't stay in a place of anger. But turn to the Lord and say, God, I don't understand what's going on here. Now, I, I praise the Lord that in this instance, in this biblical text, this isn't the end. There's a verse 21. Look at it. 1 Kings 17, 21. And so Elijah stretched, him out over, stretched himself out over the job three times. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, please let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's prayer. And the life of the child returned, and he revived. And then Elijah brought him up out of that room, down the stairs, and gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. And the woman told Elijah, Now I know for sure that you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. I wonder why Elijah had to stretch himself out full length over the boy three times, the Bible says. I can tell you this much, I see here persistence in this prayer. Do we call out to God like that, persistent in our prayers? Jesus talks about that, about being persistent, desperate, hungry, single-minded. Did you notice that the biblical account here specifically lists that Elijah prayed with all of his might? Then God shows up in the middle of this drought, in the center of this fake God Baal worshiping place, among the deadness of this widow's home in the backwater of Seraphat village. God listened to Elijah's prayer and he chose to act to breathe supernatural life within his being. And the boy was suddenly alive. Did you know, I didn't know this until this week, did you know that this is the first instance recorded in the Bible of someone being raised from the dead? Did you know that? I did not know that. This is it. These three miracles of the flower never ending, the oil never ending, the boy's resurrection, strikingly manifest God's glory and God's love. They demonstrated to Elijah, the widow, and the whole community, even in the midst of these tragic circumstances, God's power, God's care, God's activity on behalf of those who serve him and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. What incredulous joy there must have been as Elijah came down over that stairwell. Carrying the boy who is now very alive. Here's your son, says Elijah. Restored, alive, whole, healthy, renewed. It's interesting to note that the Canaanites, these people that lived in this area, they actually believed that God, that Baal, their false god, had to submit periodically to the god of death named Mot. But here, deep in Baal country, Yahweh God demonstrated not only his power to sustain life in the time of drought, but also his power to overcome death. The experience of this foreign, godless woman, this widow of Zarephath, contrasts 
the utter faithlessness of the ancient Israelites at this time in history. The woman replied to Elijah, I see it now, you are a holy man. When you speak, God speaks a true word. Characteristic number eight of the most horrible day, you say, now I know for sure that God is real. Gospel of Mark chapter 9. Jesus similarly healed a little boy. He was demon possessed. And in verse 24 of Mark 9, the father of the boy cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Friends, today may we believe God. May we trust God. May we depend on God. Not as a sideshow distraction. Not as an occasional hobby. Not as a 10.30 to 11.30 Sunday morning time slot. But as the master, the savior, the healer, awesome creator, almighty God. In the gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 27, the resurrected Christ shows his, his wounds from the cross to his doubting disciple Thomas. Jesus said, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Believe. And Thomas exclaimed, oh, my Lord, my God. But Jesus told him these words in response. You believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Friends, today I thank God that God did raise this widow of Zarephath's son from the dead. But I challenge you with this today. Looking at the whole counsel of scripture, yet may we believe even in the middle of rough times, even if our son is not raised from the dead, may we believe. I want my own life, I want my life to be like that of Job of the Old Testament who proclaimed in Job 13, 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Let's fully obey God, friends. Let's fully obey God, not just for what we want, but for what he wants. His kingdom purposes, His eternal plan, His glory, His honor, His praise. I remember after attending Bible college on campus in Ontario, I came home and I started ministry, full-time ministry as a pastor, working as a youth pastor, working many long hours for, frankly, I'm just being honest, very meager pay. Money was very tight every week. Then in 2002, my 1988 Toyota Corolla that I owned died. And when I say it died, it really died. The head gasket went. I didn't have any money for a new car. I didn't have any money, period. But you know what's interesting? Through God's purposes and plan, don't have time to tell you the whole story now, but God ended up providing, miraculously, opening doors and providing me a car that was reliable and worked well and through all of that he taught me to trust him for my daily provision most of us let's be honest okay we're family here most of us would probably rather if God provided an abundance long before our resources were depleted rather than just enough for every day Right? Let's be honest. Wouldn't it be great if your bank account was full and you had a nice car in the yard and, you know, the new roof on the house and everything's going good. You're like, thank you, God, for providing for me. It's great. It, it probably would be more fun to do that than have to trust him urgently in the middle of crisis. Urgently, we need this. Oh, God, help us with this tough spot. Our loving Heavenly Father whispers us into the heart of hearts and he says these two words. He welcomes us to relationship with Him. Trust me. Trust me. See what I will do. Trust me. Trust me, He says. As the worship team comes back, 
I want to pause and say here again, right now, today, moms, we love you. Moms, we love you. In what can seem at times like it might be the most horrible day you've ever experienced. Tough times, being a mom today, being a lady today, serving the Lord today, working for God today. May you know that God does love you. I thank God for all of our ladies. And in case you wonder why we keep promoting ladies and not just moms, it's because there's all kinds of moms, spiritual moms, mentoring moms, people that have influenced others and continue to. And we thank God for you. You are phenomenal leaders for the Lord. May you today, I don't care who you are, male, female, doesn't matter, may you be like that widow of Zarephath who obeyed the Lord, believing God eventually, for the triumph of the Lord, for his honor. All of us, even in the middle of the worst days of our lives, so it seems, we can allow God to teach us, to grow us, strengthen us, to fill us, to use us for his kingdom purposes, his eternal plan. Despite the most horrible days, I want to encourage you, God is still at work. No, it may not be all perfect. No, it may not be all rosy and excellent. There may be difficult challenges even today that lie before you. There's some things on your prayer list that they're, they're looking pretty tough. There's some things coming up on the calendar and you frankly don't know how it's going to work out. I just want to encourage you, God's not done. God's not done. God's not done. The Lord God, Yahweh, the Lord God, Jehovah, Jesus, he's still working. He's not done with you yet. Yes, there's big challenges. Yes. But you know what? That means there's opportunities for the victory of God. Hello? Those challenges that lie before us, those difficulties, there's fresh opportunities for God to break through. Amen? There's, there's space for God to triumph. Amen? Because he's still at work. He's still powerful. He's still mighty. So that most horrible day doesn't have to be your epitaph. May we trust God. May we depend on God. Give him your little tiny bit of flour, okay? Give him that little bit of oil. Give him your son who's dead. See what he will do. See what he will do. Even in the middle of, a, of an evil land, even in the middle of a drought, even in the middle of great, great stacked up troubles, see what he will do. So God, do it in us right now. You know the you know the situation, so you see the hearts, you know what's going on. I don't have a clue, but you do, Lord. So I just call out to you to minister, Lord, to work in those things. Heal, Lord, deliver, Lord, provide, Lord, change circumstances, restore relationships, bring backsliders back to you, call to repentance, Lord, call to life, Lord. Those situations, those things, out of nowhere, we'll be shocked. You'll just show up, God. All of a sudden, they'll come to our door and they'll knock and say, Grammy, I don't know what this is going on, but Jesus is getting a hold of my life. He's getting a hold of my attention. What do I do? What must I do to be saved? Lord, we, we will hang on to you. We won't give up. We will trust in you in the midst of those difficulties. Help us, God. In this moment of our healing, restoration, we receive from you, O oh God. We receive from you, O oh God. We receive from you. We receive from you. Yes, O oh Lord, do it in us, do it through us, Lord.